say good morning to Kim Moss. She is here to take us in the next step of our journey in the gospel shape. So, Kim, go for it. Take Amen. it away. Oh, good morning, everybody. It's so good to be here. And uh, I'm always flying in from somewhere. I just got home from London and France, and it was an amazing time. Um, I'm here this morning to talk to you about the gospel shapes. We're in a series right now about the gospel shapes everything in our life. Isn't that right? We have learned that the gospel actually is that all throughout human history, God has been working to reconcile all of humanity to himself through the, the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is really the gospel. It really started in Genesis. It didn't start in Matthew. It started in Genesis, and it goes throughout the, uh, throughout the entire uh, canon, the entire scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. Here's another thing, though, part of the gospel, is that he didn't just, uh, he didn't, Jesus didn't just come. God didn't just raise up humanity, uh, create humanity, and then bring Jesus on the scene to, to do his work and then to uh, die and resurrect just so that you could be saved. But it was also so that you could be filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered to obey his word and to fulfill the mission of Christ. Because what Jesus started, we're supposed to be continuing until the day he returns. And so the gospel and that truth about what Jesus has done um, should shape how we think about who we are, how we understand the decisions we're making, how we see everything. And my job today is to talk to you about how the gospel shapes our perspective. So the perspective, you know, is how you see and understand everything that you go through. Because how you see things, how you understand things, how you uh, perceive things will make a difference in the decisions you make in the middle of any circumstance. Isn't that right? So I was thinking about some of the things that we, that uh, some of the things that I have received a new perspective on and that the church has received new perspectives on, on over the years. You know, I just got back from a prophetic conference in Dallas, Dallas, Texas, where there were 40 nations, prophets from 40 different nations that came to talk about what they see in this next season happening. And you know, here's some of the things that I heard which were amazing, and I hope they shape your perspective the way they began to shape mine. First thing is that they talked about Washington. Do you know that there are several intercessors who have moved to Washington simply to intercede for what's going on in our country? You know, sometimes we get so wrapped up in our daily lives here in, in Simi Valley, in Moorpark. I live in Moorpark. You know, and we go to work every day. We get up and we, we deal with our family. We deal with the leaky sink or, you know, the carpet needs replacing. We deal with things going on at work and the bills that we have to pay and all that, that we lose perspective of the big picture. And so here's the big picture. There are people who are interceding um, intentionally over what's going on in the politics of our nation. Do you know there's a set of intercessors um, that are hundreds of them that, are, that they pray over every single tweet that President Trump sends out? You think they're busy? I'm telling you that's a 24-7 job. But that's amazing. Is that a not amazing? I think that's amazing. There's another thing that's happening. Now, I know this from my own travels and my own experience, but do you know that the Muslim community in the Middle East, do you know that they're getting saved by the hundreds because Jesus is showing up in their dreams? I mean, this is an amazing thing. And so there are things happening all over the world like that. Do you know that the same thing is beginning to happen in the LGBTQ um, community? Listen, listen, we see, see, we, if we perceive the Muslim community, if we perceive the LGBTQ, I don't know, and I know there's other letters, I don't know them, community, <laughs> in a certain way, then we don't see them as an opportunity for the gospel. Listen, this happened once before, you know. Anybody here was part of the Jesus People movement? Right? Right? And so what happened is that, see, God sovereignly began to move among the hippies in the 60s. And they started coming into church. And there's a famous story by John Wimber, I happen to know a friend of his, that, that goes like something like this, that they came into the church, you know what I mean, and, and they were ruining, because they were stinky, smelly, dirty hippies. 
like real hippies, the kind you know that, this happened in California, hey, on the California coast. And they came into the church, stinky, smelly, dirty, no shoes, and they were messing up the, the seats and the carpets. And the people started to complain, they're, they're ruining our seats and our carpets, because what, they had a certain perspective? And the pastor said, then tear out the carpet. And it became the Jesus People Movement, one of the most, one of the most famous revival movements in that period of time, you see? Do you see what's happening? So I, there's another thing going on. Do you know, I've been to Brazil many, many times. I talked to you guys about it. You know, they elected a new president. His name is Bolsonaro. Um, several of us prayed for it. Several of us prophesied over it. And anyway, it happened. And you know, he's the Trump of Brazil. He's the pre- and do you know, there's so much division among the people. Some people hate him. Some people love him. But I'll tell you what he did do. He opened up and he made it more free for the churches to move. And the church in Brazil is rising up under that because they understand the opportunity that they have been given. And, so, and then there are people from our country who are going, oh, this is an unprecedented opportunity. Why? Because they have a certain perspective and they understand the gospel. Okay, and so what happens is that they, they have do, they're doing this thing called the send. I think I mentioned it to Harold last time and said, Harold, you ought to go. Anyway, I'm going. It's in February. So what has happened is that, see, the prophets have been saying for a long time that in Brazil they're going to probably become, they are going to become the greatest missionary sending country that church history has ever known. And so, you know, we've been sowing into that for all of these years. And so they gathered a group of people, a group of people like Lou Engle and some of these other people, and they're going down to Brazil with other Brazilian leaders, and they're gathering people, and they started with a stadium. This is happening in February. And they started calling calling out the young people because they want to send them as missionaries all over the world with the gospel that will change and transform people's lives. Anyway, this is what has happened. They started to open it up for tickets and they filled up a stadium. 60,000. They filled it to capacity. There was so many, so, such a waiting list, they, they opened up another stadium and they filled it to capacity. And there were so many people waiting for tickets that they opened up another stadium and they have filled it to capacity and I believe they're working on a fourth. Listen, do you know how many young people that is? Do you think a nation is about to be changed? It's time for us to change our perspective. We have to get a bigger picture of what God is doing all over the world and then our piece in it. Because listen, he cares about Simi Valley as much as he cares about Brazil. He cares about Simi Valley as much as he cares about the Middle East and the Muslims there. He cares about us just as much as any people and God is on the move. And he doesn't care just about groups and people groups and big things, though we need to have a bigger perspective, but he cares also about the one. I was in Guyana just recently, right? And I'm, I'm preaching and, I, and, I, and I, the Lord said something about, about what was going on in the atmosphere. And I, I preached that. And this girl comes up to me afterwards and she is 22 years old. And she hands me a 15 page letter. I, I read it on the plane. As I'm reading it on the plane, I am sobbing my eyes out. She says that she has been abused since the time she was three years old. She's been passed from hand to hand to hand because her mother didn't care about her. And her fathers, many fathers and stepfathers didn't care about her. She's been raped and sexually molested and every other thing. And then she finally met someone she thought was going to love her. She got pregnant, had her own children, and she's been beaten and abused and continually. And she said she told God she was going to kill herself if he didn't do something and speak to her. And she happened to come to this conference, sat way in the back because she knows somebody at that church. And when I got up and said that it did something in her, she realized in that moment, she says in the letter, that she has a call on her life and that God created her for a purpose. It changed changed her perspective on everything that has happened. She understood now that everything that has happened to her has been an attack against her life, something sent by the enemy, not sent by God, that she was actually not hated by God and not really uh, a, an outcast or, you know, left behind or, or not cared for, unloved. She actually is loved by God and he has something for her to do and now she has everything to live for. Amen. We have to change our perspective. And so this is the message I want to bring to you today. It's called The Kingdom of God Suffers Violence, and it's from Matthew chapter 11. Would you please open up your scriptures? What is the time I need to be done by? <laughs> it's 9.49, but I, I know the amount of time, but the t- actual time. 10.20? All right. Thank you. So I know I talk fast already, but you know, are you ready to go? 
All right, so open up to Matthew chapter 11, please. Listen, from the days of John the Baptist until now, what? The kingdom of, of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. We are living in a very powerful time and God is moving all over the world. I just told you some of the things he is doing and I'm telling you people of God that playtime is over in the church. It's time that we be the church, be who God has called us to be and be what it means to be Christian in our attitudes, in our perspectives, in our behaviors, in everything we do, how we approach everything in life because the gospel of Jesus Christ is true and it should change how we see ourselves and how we see the world, which changes everything about how we approach everything. Amen. Isn't that right? Yes. Because you listen, Pastor John didn't start this series because it's a nice series for you to have some notes on some important key uh, elements of teaching. It's actually supposed to come inside you and shape you so that you become who God has called you to be. Why? Because listen, God is doing something on the earth. He's doing it right now, and it's coming here too, and it's time for us to get ready so we can participate in it. Our lives, we sometimes, we think our life is all about going to work and making some money so we can retire and then go on vacation. It's not about that at all. When you read scripture, you see it's not about that at all. It's about that God created you on purpose for a purpose. And what is your purpose? Well, I see it every time I get up here, and I'm going to continue to say it every time Pastor John lets me up here. It's Mark 16, 15 to 18. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Why? Because it transforms lives. Because there are the lost that need to get saved. There are the sick that need to be healed. There are the demon possessed who need to get free. There are orphans that need to be placed in families. There are people who need to know that they are loved. There are many people that need to know that they have an identity beyond what they were called when they were children when somebody abused them. And so playtime is over and there's an intensity right now in the heavens. I don't know if you feel, I am really into geopolitics. I read articles on the t all the time because listen, the nations are our inheritance and God cares about every nation, not just America. And let me tell you something else. I was, uh, one of the things that I heard this last couple of weeks was there's uh, Korea. Do you know, you know all the stuff going on with South Korea, North Korea, South Korea? Right, so North Korea, you know, is communist. South Korea is actually, uh, was helped by the Americans and they're a democratic sort of society, okay? Well, do you know that the president of South Korea is making deals with the president of North Korea and the Christians in that country are understanding that if that actually merger happens and even if they, if they unify the Koreas, it means probably that they become a communist country and then the, perse and then the persecution of the Christians is gonna go through the roof. And I mean severe persecution, like put into concentration camps, like sort of like an Auschwitz type of thing. And so do you know in response to this, the church in South Korea, we don't get to see this on the news, but I saw pictures of it two weeks ago. The church in South Korea, all the churches, every denomination, you know, they're not sitting there, they're not wasting their time saying, well, you are this and I am this. And you know, I follow Paul, you follow Apollos. It's not any of that kind of competition, but they understand they're all in some deep trouble right now. And so over a million Christians, um, can you imagine this? Over a million are going every Friday night and doing all night prayer on the street in front of their, you know, their capital. Every Friday night, it's been going on for months and it's continuing and they're praying that that man gets saved. And they're praying that their country is saved. And they're praying for President Trump and our country to understand the, the consequences and the cost with some of the things that are going on in the nations right now. I don't know. Like, when was the last time we felt like we, I mean, they're pictured in the rain all night long, in the cold. I don't know. When was the last time you were up all night praying for your country? Just saying. So I love geopolitics, you know, but right now there's all kinds of shifts and, and that all the nations, they're vying for political power. Do you understand what's going on? Listen, the, it's, it's really a violent time that we live in right now, but I want you to know that violent times are supposed to be a sign to us because we're Christians and the gospel shapes our perspective.
We're supposed to see violent times as a sign to us. And what are they a sign of? Of a fresh awakening and the next move of God is actually on the earth at this time. We're about to see a demonstration of the gospel in this generation that probably no generation has ever seen. I'm just telling you, it's coming. But everywhere I look right now, there is trial, there's testing, there's backlash, there's challenges, there's intensity, there's sickness, and there's lots of suffering, lots of loss. Isn't that right? How many of you in this room right now in the last year has been a tough it has been a tough year it's been a tough eight years it's been a tough decade I know people right now that it's been a tough two weeks so tough that they are really tempted to turn back take their ball and go home and that is exactly what the enemy wants you to do they want he wants you to see all of your life through the problems that you have instead of seeing them through the gospel Listen, there's warfare about over what God is doing right now. Why? Because the kingdom of God suffers violence. And for the last several years, God has been using these circumstances. Why? For First Peter. That was my, my cue. <laughs> for all the millions of scriptures that I have for her. First Peter, and this is your great salvation. You rejoice that even though now for a little while you've been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith being more precious than God than gold which is perishable even though tested by fire may be found to be the result of praise glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ that's a fresh perspective how about how about James when he says consider it all joy when you encounter all kinds of various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces what endurance how about hebrews this is actually 10 35 to 39 which is my favorite passage of scripture Rem um no i'm sorry it's not 35 to 39 do you have the right one up there yes thank you good okay it's 10 30 whatever that is right there <laughs> remember but recall the former days when after you were enlightened you endured a hard struggle with sufferings sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction sometimes being partners with those so treated you had compassion on those in prison you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one therefore do not throw away your confidence which has a rich reward for you have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of god you may wait yeah may receive what is promised how about that for a, for a fresh perspective? I don't know. When was the last time we had that perspective? Yeah, I get it. So our faith is being challenged by these circumstances, and, but it's supposed, to, it's supposed to produce in us an endurance that we can outlast anything that the enemy does because we have Jesus and we win. Listen, this is who we are. And listen, the, sh the violent times are, not noth are nothing new. Jesus said we were going to have them. Our God is not sitting up on the throne going, I just don't know what to do about that problem. <laughs> I, I don't know where we get that, but we do. So Matthew 11, 1 to 24, John the Baptist needs a perspective change. And we're going to read about that. And Jesus' response to John gives us the perspective and the revelation, means something that we, we didn't know before, that God is revealing to us that we need for our very time. So let's read in uh, Matthew 11, starting in verse one. When Jesus had finished instructing his disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and he said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered and said, go and tell them what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? Reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing in kings are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he from the days of john the baptist until now the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force for all the prophets and the law prophesied until john and if you're willing to accept it he's the elijah to come he who has ears to hear let him hear but to what shall i compare this generation it's like a children sitting in the marketplace calling to their playmates we played the flute for you you did not dance we sang a dirge for you you did not mourn for john came neither eating nor drinking 
drinking, and they say he's got a demon. The son of man came in eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. And then he began to denounce the cities where his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done and you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So what is God talking about here? I mean, what is this scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit? What are we supposed to get from that? We're supposed to get a whole perspective change just like John did. And so let's talk about that a little bit. John's question in verses three to six, are you the one who is coming or shall we look for another? Doesn't that surprise you just a little bit? It should surprise you just a little bit because isn't John the one who was sent to prepare the way of the Lord? Wait a minute, isn't John the prophet? A prophet foretells and foretells the times, the seasons, and the secrets, and the ways of God. Didn't he already determine that this was Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the one they were waiting for, the one who fulfills all the promises of the Old Testament? Well, let's go back and read John 1, 29 to 36. The next day, he, meaning John the Baptist, he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this is of he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he would be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him and I myself did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? So the father gave him a sign. He saw the sign. He knew this was Jesus. He knew this was Jesus. He saw the dove descend. He heard the voice of God. He declared that he was the Lamb of God, the Messiah. So why in the world is John asking this question, are you the one? Well, for that, we have to sort of understand the context I'm going to skip that. Okay, we have to understand the context. Listen, and I'm not going to go through all the scriptures because it will take me too long, and I want you to get this, okay? Is that, see, he had an expectation of Jesus. He was already announcing to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to Herod, who was the corrupt religious king of the Jews, he represented religious corruption, and to Pilate, who was the, uh, Caesar, who was the king of Rome, king of all the world at that time, which was a political oppression of the people. He's announcing, oh, there's a revolution coming and you guys better watch yourself because there's a new king in town. See, he expected him to be sort of like, not sort of, but he expected him to be a king like David. What did David do? David conquered all the other nations and he set Israel on top and then he set a religious political order in place. He expected him to be like Moses who delivered the people out of the hand of their oppressor in Egypt. He expected him to be like Elijah who restored true worship and, and overcame any religious corruption. He expected all those kinds of things. So when he says that this is the new king, it is full of this expectation. And John, like all of Israel, expected the same thing. He's expecting this religious and political revolution. And where is John? Do you know? When he writes this, when, when this little thing is happening, where is John? He's in prison. Wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute. Now, didn't he do everything God asked him to do? Didn't he actually even give some of his disciples to Jesus? Didn't he, did he, did he do anything that was sinful or wrong or deserving of punishment? This was completely unjust. This was violence that was happening to him. And Jesus says, don't be offended by me. Because listen, he's in prison doing, he's done everything right. He's expecting all of this. And what's Jesus doing about his imprisonment? And so Jesus says, don't be offended by me. Do you know that word means scandalizo in the Greek? It means scandalize. It means don't get entrapped by it. Don't get stuck there. Don't get tripped up by it. It actually, when you look at the, when you look at the etymology, the beginning of the world, it actually means that John was being enticed to unbelief. 
because of his unmet expectations. How about us? How about us? When we start suffering injustice, when things don't go right, when we have prayed for an awful long time for God to do something, when we've had a prophetic word and it's not coming to pass, and everything in our lives, everything we're experiencing is nothing like what we expected, then we too are enticed to unbelief. We become offended with God. We become offended with each other. We become offended with President Trump. We become offended with the LGBT community. We can become offended with them. We become offended with everything. And all that is is the enemy enticing us to unbelief. So we get tripped up and we no longer see our lives, our circumstances, and the things that are happening in the world through gospel perspective. This is important. This is really important. And so Jesus responds to John's question. And I love what he says. He gives us three important revelations. In, John, in Matthew 11, two to five, it says, now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he went and sent word, are you the one? And Jesus answered him, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news. That word is evangelion, which is the gospel preached to them. And so what is the first revelation? What is the first perspective we're supposed to have? The kingdom's come. The kingdom has come. So Jesus is the spirit anointed king and he is busy setting captives free, fulfilling prophecy. In Luke 4, 18 to 21, he goes into the synagogue at the very beginning of his ministry. He opens up the scroll to Isaiah 61 and he reads that passage of scripture. Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim the good news. It's time to set the captives free. And then he says to them this odd thing that they were sort of curious about. Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing because the day of salvation had come. And so I love what N.T. Wright says about this passage. Their vision, meaning the vision of the people, John, disciples, people who are listening to Jesus, their vision of the kingdom was all about a revolution, swords and spears and surprise attacks, some hurt, some killed, winning in the end. Violence to defeat violence, a holy war against unholy warriors. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. If he slaps you on the cheek, makes you walk with him a mile, stab him with his own dagger. That's the sort of kingdom vision the people had. And Jesus could see with the clarity of a prophet and common sense where this would lead. It was better to be in Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone raining from heaven than fighting God's battle with the devil's weapons. Talk about perspective. Talk about how we see, how we see the things we're going through. If we see the things we're going through from the place of our flesh, from the place of our culture, from the place of our politics, from the place, listen, from the place of being an American. Being an American, what is, you know that we, we are born to be pioneers. We are revolutionists. We are, we are those people. Even in the church, the Protestant movement was all about, a, was all about a, a, an uprising against the status quo because there was abuse, abuses. It was a protest. That's why it's Protestantism. Okay, and so we're born out of these things. And even in America, our culture is all about our rights. It's my right to have this. It's my right, you know. And so we approach our relationships that way. We approach our jobs that way. We, repro- we, we approach our families that way. We, we approach everything that way because it's a mindset and a perspective that I should have my rights. But listen, I don't know about you, but when I read the gospel, it seems to me like Jesus gave up all his rights to come and save me while I was yet a sinner. Not because I looked cute or because I was smart or because he thought I could do something for him. I was nothing. How about you? Those of you when Jesus found you, you didn't deserve it. None of us deserved it. And yet he saw the value and the worth in our humanity and he loved us anyway. Woo! When he says, love your enemy, Give a cup of cold water to your enemy. Woo, I don't know. We have to have a gospel perspective to be able to do that. And so the revelation number two, a new era has dawned. The least in the kingdom of God now is greater than John the Baptist. What is he saying? He's saying everything. 
everything changes now because I came. We have a new covenant. What does that mean? Jesus died. He resurrected. We can be saved. That's a preparation for us receiving the Holy Spirit so we can be empowered to do the works that he did that were created for us to do even before we were ever born. When was the last time we stepped into those? Just saying. It's a new order. There's a, re there's a reversal now. See, success in the kingdom doesn't look like success in the world. I don't know, these, these precious people in Turkey. I have a friend who's a missionary in Turkey. It's one of the hardest grounds to, to plow in the world besides maybe Japan. It's a hard ground to plow and people are getting killed for their faith there. The Syrian refugees, there are so many of them. How do we even begin to make a dent in what's going on there? And yet they've given up their whole lives. So, you know, their family, maybe when they said they were gonna go to Turkey, their family probably said, you are absolutely crazy. Don't you know you could die there? Success in the kingdom looks a whole lot different than success in America. Just saying. It's a new government with a new king. This is a spiritual revolution, and I'm just telling you that nobody's gonna be able to stand with one, one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom anymore. It's gonna, there's a dividing line that's coming very soon in our country. I'm prophesying to you right now. I'm telling you that this is happening. And I'm not saying whether Trump is gonna get elected again or not, because I don't know. I have friends who say absolutely so. I have other friends going, hmm, I don't know. You know, prophetically, they're saying yes. Most of the prophets are saying yes. But I'm telling you what happens after him. Look at everyone else who's running in our country. Socialism which is related to what? Communism. And they say it's not, but it is. And you look at Argentina, look at Venezuela, look at some of the other countries who've been through some of these things. What if we go there? Are you ready? We're gonna need to change our perspective. We really have to have a gospel perspective. Number three, number that, and that goes with Revelation number three. Conflict is unavoidable in the kingdom of God. See, because what, God, what Jesus is saying here when he says the kingdom of God suffers violence, the violent take us by force, it's about a pattern of movement that we see all throughout the scripture. We see that God begins to move and there's always, there's always a move against it from the enemy. So you can bet your bottom dollar that when you give your life to Christ, that somebody is not gonna be happy about it. And there's gonna be opposition and you have to see that as a sign to you that you are moving with the Holy Spirit. We have to see things differently. God is bringing a kingdom move and the, God, and the enemy is stirring up kingdom violence, is stirring up violence against the kingdom. And so what are we supposed to do? And this is, this is the end of this message. We are supposed to become the violent. And what does that mean? Listen, violence the world looks like our enemy murdering, stealing, killing, and destroying. Isn't that right? It looks like religious zealots in the world um, Acting, thinking they're acting on God's behalf and they, they're killing Christians and Jews and Americans, the French, the British, the Egyptians, the Syrians and innocent civilians all over the world. It looks like, it looks like child brides having to get married at nine years old. It looks like you, you didn't please your husband in India and so you get burnt oil poured on you and set on fire if you're a woman. It looks like children of five and six years old being sold into slavery or stolen and used as sex slaves. It looks like religious persecution and intolerance of every kind, Muslims against Christians, Christians against Muslims, anti-Semitism, anti-Catholic, you name it, it's all there. Pastors and leaders, it looks like pastors and leaders who are addicted to pornography, sexual sin and per perversion, using their power and their authority to sexually and spiritually abuse God is placed underneath them. It looks like p political corruption and violent political divisions within and without our nation. It looks like cultural wars, racism, abortion on demand, euthanasia, the breakdown of marriage and family, then gender choice forced on our children in our schools here in Simi Valley, Moore Park, and Thousand Oaks. It looks like our cities and nations filled with the abuse and violent oppression of women and children, whether in the home where they're supposed to be nurtured or dragged off to some place in Mexico, the rape camps in Middle East, the latest nail and massage, man, nail massage place in Los Angeles. It looks like murder, rage, and violence in our streets, in the high schools, at the borderline bar in grill and in and, and one of the safest cities in America. It looks like the heroin and suicide epidemic in our city and region right here. It looks like my mom who died of cancer. It looks like my friends 
whose children, some of my family members, whose children are ravaged by mental illness. It looks like neighbors that I've known down my street and down your streets, whose families are being torn apart by alcoholism, drug addiction, and you name every other kind of thing. But we are the violent who take it by force. And what does the violence in the kingdom look like? It looks like the deaf woman who receives her hearing. It looked like the man with brain injury that I prayed for and he got up out of his chair. It looks like the Haitian children receiving VBS at Christmas time through this church. It looks like the young woman in Canada I met who never felt loved and as soon as she felt the touch of Jesus, she knew she was loved. It looks like widows and orphans being invited into our homes for Thanksgiving dinner. It looks like the homeless out in the, in the laundry mats getting clean, clean clothes because we're doing laundry love. It looks like the leper healed, the demoniac delivered. It looks like the widow's son raised from the dead. It looks like Jesus and all his followers laying down their lives to reconcile the world to God. It's, that's the spiritual revolution we're looking for. It looks like you and me willing to lay down our rights, our comforts, and our convenience and our resources to speak up and step up and do the right thing. And listen, I don't know when we forgot this as a church, but death is not the worst thing that can happen to us. We have to remember that the gospel even shapes that perspective on death. Listen, death has lost its sting. We don't ever really die. Jesus is not dead. Your friends and neighbors and, and the people that went before us who have died who were Christians are not dead. They are alive. I'll tell you what's the worst thing is to stand before God on the last day, knowing all the things we know, having all the resources that we have, and we brought none of them to bear on the world. For the sake of the gospel, the lost, the dying, the sick, the demonized, to be unfaithful, to the call of God and the church. That's the worst thing. And so in this season, I'm telling you that we have to meet the violence of our world in our daily lives. I know we face tough things. Trust me, I know. Because I have faced them too. Because I'm just a human, just like you. But in this season, we have to face the violence of the world with violent love and violent joy and violent peace, and violent grace, and violent faith, and violent worship, and violent prayer, violent generosity, and how about this one, violent forgiveness? What are you still holding on to? That you've been offended over, and it has tempted you to unbelief, and when you give in to unbelief, then you cannot believe anything from God. How violent are we gonna be? How violent will we be? I'm telling you, his violence looks like the kingdom of God. What was the first clue that we had? I'll tell you, it happened in the Garden of Gethsemane when our Jesus, our Savior, who was going to die on a cross for us, for our sin in his time, the sin of all humanity in all time. While we were yet sinners before we ever knew him or even cared or even knew his name. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's getting ready to be taken to the cross. An army of soldiers come to arrest him. And what happens? I love this Peter who I love and I always relate to so much. You know, he's just standing there, whips out his sword, right? And he does what? Cuts off the ear of that guy, of one of the soldiers. But what does Jesus do? He goes and he picks up that ear. And he heals the very man that was gonna lead him to the most brutal death on my behalf. This is kingdom violence. What do, you think, what do you think that guy thought for the rest of his life that got healed by this man, Jesus? What do you think? You know, listen, we have to change our perspective, people of God. Everything that happens, when violent things happen, when, when people come against us, when we suffer injustice, when we suffer loss and tragedy, we have to look at it from a kingdom perspective and we have to know that not only is God with us and he walks through us to walk through, through, walks through everything with us to comfort us and to heal us, yes, those are all true things. But oftentimes, those very situations are actually possibilities for us to step into and bring the gospel and see a redemption because our God is a redeemer. 
to see a miracle? When was the last time you looked? When, when was the last time you saw your circumstances in that way? When was the last time you saw a block happen for a promotion that you were supposed to have at your work and you saw it rather as God opening a window of opportunity in some other way? There are no victims in the kingdom. It is true that we suffer victimization, but our identity is not victim. We have to stop looking at everything through those lenses. Amen. Would you stand up, please? When you begin to see your life as a written epistle, for everyone you come in contact with, when you begin to see your life as a mission of, for Jesus, that you are to complete the works of Jesus, then everyone you ever meet, every place you ever go, becomes your mission field, and it becomes full of possibility for you to bring the gospel to transform the lives of those around you. It's not enough, listen, it's not enough when we suffer something, if we go into hiding and say, okay, I'm just gonna protect myself, and I'm just gonna hide right here so that, you know, and then someday Jesus will come and I'll be with him. You know, what, the enemy wins, do you see? because he has changed your viewpoint, he has changed your mindset, and he has won in your mind, and when he's won in your mind, then he's won in your behavior. We are the people of God. We bring a change. God does miracles through us, and everything we go through is an opportunity for Jesus to be lifted high, everything. Would you join hands with your neighbor, please? Listen, if you are here this morning and you're a guest, I know I've been yelling at you all morning. I'm just so passionate about this. I can't even tell you. I am so passionate about this. There is work to do and God is here and the Holy Spirit is moving all over the earth and I want us to be a part of it. We have to open up our worldview. But if you're here this morning visiting and you have never received Jesus and you know today that he is that all the violence that you have suffered has been the enemy trying to keep you apart from the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And you wanna know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want you to meet with me right after service. I don't have time to do an altar call, but I'm doing an altar call. I want you to meet me after service and Pastor John and I will pray for you and we will welcome you into this family that is empowered to do the works of Christ on the earth. But for the rest of you, just want you to begin to pray for the person on your left and your right right now. Just ask God to begin to change their mind about their current pain and situation. God, just begin to bring change right now in their mindset. Renew our minds. Let us see, God, that we are the violent. We are the violent. That we don't have to be on the defensive. We get to be on the offensive, God, not offended. You know what, I'm gonna have you do something else. Put your hand on your head and your heart right now on your own. If you know you have an offense this morning and you've gotten stuck there and it has tempted you to unbelief because of something that you have suffered or gone through, would you right now just deal, do business with God and just tell him, I come out of agreement with that offense, God. I come out of agreement with that. Tell him that you give him permission to change your mind about that situation. Ask him to forgive you for being offended and giving in to unbelief, which has separated you from him. And ask him to bring you near once more and open up your ears to hear a new word, a fresh word. Thanks, Jesus.